Tonight on Insight, do these dogs really love us and what goes on inside their brains? Welcome everybody and welcome too to all these uh, lovely pooches. Let's have a look first tonight at some of the latest research into what dogs might be thinking. Initially it was really just a, an idea to see whether we could figure out what dogs are thinking by training them to go into an MRI and measure activity in their brains while they were in the scanner. We don't really know that much about how the dog's mind works and how their brains are organized, even though, you know, we live with them. We, we don't even have basic information about what parts of their brain do what. And so that's one thing that we're trying to figure out. We have about 20 dogs participating. It's not a little training process. It's a rather extensive training process to get them to hold still. We don't use any anesthesia, no sedation, no drugs, no restraints. Um, most dogs, it takes, I'd say, two to four months of training to learn how to do this. Now we're looking at very complicated uh, processes in the dog's brain, things related to impulse control, for example, how they process faces, how they process smells. Um, we're even exploring uh, their memory systems right now. This is a map of each dog's brain, and what it shows you is the areas, these hot spots here, are the areas that respond most strongly to reward. What is interesting is where we present the dogs with things like the smells of their owners and compare it to people and dogs that they don't know. We also see activity in exactly that same part of the brain. That's important because it shows that dogs recognize the scents of the people they live with and that they have positive feelings for them. I mean, I'm willing to call that love of a sort. I mean, it means that they, they have preferred people. And so I think that's love, yeah. Pauline Bennett, what do you think? Uh, your background's in clinical neuropsychology. What do you make of that MRI scan research? And do you think dogs do feel love? I, I love the research. I think it's great and I wish I could do it. Whether they actually feel love, I feel like my dogs do. So if you're asking me as a dog owner, then yes, definitely, my dogs love me like I love them. But as a scientist, I don't know how to tell. The fact that a, an area of brain lights up and it's the same area that lights up in a human really doesn't answer that question for us. Love to me is a feeling, not an area of brain lighting up. So the fact that the, the same area of brain lights up is really interesting and it's evidence that it could feel the same, but we can't tell what dogs feel. Will we ever be able to tell? I don't think so. Jay, you're uh, here with your miniature poodle, Noodle. Um, <laughs> do you think Noodle loves you? Definitely. He loves me. Right? Noodle, do you love me? OK. Why do you think he loves you? <laughs> because uh, it's a sign. For example, every day when I come home, I just need to put in the key into the keyhole and I could hear the cl claws clicking. <laughs> and then I could hear, see him jumping up and down with joy because uh, he sees me and sometimes... Do you think he might see you or do you think he might see food and dinner? <laughs> no, he sees me because I come home without food and dinner. So, uh, yeah, and, and I, I give him a lot of care. I live with him. He's my best buddy. He's my roommate. And... Um, so you think it's love that he feels? It is love, definitely. Tell us about his personality. What kind of life does he live? He is very cheeky. He loves going to bathroom when I'm having a shower and grab my shorts and run away. <laughs> and I would yell at him and he would look back and keep running. <laughs> and that, that's, that's him. He's now so he, had a, he recently had a second birthday party, is that right? That was about a year ago. How did yeah. that go? Uh, I think we've got some so shots well. of the birthday party. Can we yeah. have a look at those? Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, so, so there he is. And, and, and you've got outfits for him as I well. I do, actually, yes. In, in fact, I started a pet fashion business because of him. 
OK, he's not showing off his shirt, but we, we'll try and get a good look at his shirt a bit later too. <laughs> Steve Austin, you've trained dogs for 25 years. Do you think Noodle is capable of loving Jay? Look, Steph, they have emotions, that's for sure. Whether it's love like we understand love, you know, partner to partner, son to daughter and, 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 and so forth and so on, I, I don't know if they understand that like we do. And you think most dogs can be fickle? If they're taken from one owner to another, they can transfer that affection to anybody? Absolutely. Absolutely. They live for the now time and if they're being looked after correctly and they'd be given the reward that they want and the, and the attention that they want, they're loyal. Absolutely. Maybe I can take Jay's dog and take, you know, Moodle home with me and after a couple of days he might just say, Jay, he's a nice guy. But I really like what you do too, Steve, you know? So I could maybe, <laughs> maybe I could do it. So are you quite confident about that? No, but I'd give it a shot. If You'd you give it a shot. <laughs> OK. Jay, what do you think? I would like to disagree with that. I think dogs are 101% loyal to their owners. And I actually have a story to share with you guys. Uh, I recently came back from Tokyo uh, on holiday and I came across this um, dog sculpture of a dog called... Um, Hachiko, he was owned by a professor in the University of Tokyo. And every day he would walk from home by himself to Shibuya station, the train station, to wait for the professor and meet him. And one day the professor didn't show up. And that's because he, he's dead. And then the dog kept doing that every single day, rain or shine, for the next nine years and until the dog died. Mm. That means the dog is 100%, 101% committed to the owner. He's loyal. He loves his owner. OK, anyone else want to buy into this question of love? Dogs and love? Yes, I do. Yes? I think love is universal and it manifests in different forms, just like it does in humans. And um, in terms of it, um, dogs, you know, just because they can move on to another owner doesn't mean they're not capable of love. Now, you had a guide dog? Yes, yes? I did. Until yes. how long ago? Um, about since the end of 2012. Mm. And how much yeah. emotion did you think that dog felt? As, as soon as I met her, as soon as we began training, uh, the bond just started just then and there. And I know that uh, she loved me and it wasn't motivated by food. See, I find this fascinating that people are yeah. so confident that their dogs love them when the dogs can't talk. They can't yeah. tell you whether they love you or not. Mm. Yep. I think the dogs can't tell you verbally, but they can tell you in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, Darby, for instance, will, will uh, headbutt my hand or something if he wants affection, if he wants a, a, a pat. So I think they, they're capable of communicating many, many things. Mm. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I, with Tinky, um, I have a dance studio and sometimes if I'm not there and I'll leave her with some of the other teachers, um, she behaves differently. Like, when I come back, they'll say to me, oh, she was a big sook while you were gone. Now, mm. I don't... That's... How can you explain that? Mm. Um, what do you think, Glenn, about all this? <laughs> You've got your dog here. Um, I guess it's sort of how we define love. I mean... You know, what qualifies love? I mean, yes, love is a feeling, but love is also action, isn't it? It's how you treat somebody. Action. Is that a, a cue <laughs> that this dog? Actually, it's not one of her words. <laughs> um, we, we use our own terms to define how they think, how they feel. We don't know. Maybe they do feel love, but it's, it's in their own definition of love. We're just putting our own human things on it. I wonder but, what they... Yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to ask them Yeah, right it would now, be but... phenomenal. <laughs> to read her mind would be... Yeah. Steve, what do you think? Do people read too much into it? Look, I had a dog, um, I, I, Roddy. Um, his name was King, and I got him at 14 months of age. A Rottweiler? A Rottweiler. Yep. Mm. And uh, he died way too early. He died at five or six. And I still grieve today over the dog. So um, did I love him? Most definitely, in my own way. Did he love me? He certainly enjoyed being with me. He certainly enjoyed the work that we did together. Um, do people read too much into that? Look, it's a very difficult question mm. and I think, does it Fine. really matter that much? Well, I suppose it matters if you're completely wrong, that the dog actually looks like it's happy but it's doing something else, it's surviving. Yeah, I think you're right, Jenny, but I think you can also tell from a dog. I can walk into a, a house 
and I can tell by the dog what the husband's like, what the children are like, what, what food they eat and probably how they stack their wardrobes up. But just by looking how the dog is treated and how the dog reacts around you. OK, give me an example, though. I mean, if it, how can you tell if it's a terrible family? Do I have to name any names? Oh, no. <laughs> no, they, this can be anonymous. But what, what do the dogs do She'll, in those well, situations? Well, the dog will come in. I walk into the house and the dog jumps all over you, barks. You know, the, the, the mum or the dad will say to the dog, get outside, get outside, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I can think, right, I wonder what the kids are like. Next minute, the kids come in, raining, raining, raving, jumping all over, you know. Go to bed, stop it, go to bed, stop it. And they treat the kids exactly the same as the dog. And the dog picks up on all those things as well. So you can really tell quite easily. Mm. Paul, um, you work mustering cattle. You've brought Kimmy along uh, with you tonight. What do you think about all this? Yeah, I tend to agree with Steve. Um, we can't define the love that a dog got for us, but my dogs love me just purely to take them to work. You know, they look at you and say, right, we're off to work, you know. Um, that's the type of affection that they show me. So how do you know she enjoys work, the kind of work oh, you get her to do? You know, like she... You know, I, I, uh, I have dog box on the back of my ute and my dog's travelling. Um, you've only got to open the doors and they go straight into the boxes. Mm. Is that right, though, Brad? And do you think you can get a sense of what a dog is feeling from the way it's behaving or not? For sure. I mean, looking at behaviours, you know, the, the, the ear position, the tail position, that they, you, you can tell when they're fearful, when they're, um, when they're happy. Uh, you know, this whole greeting thing when people come home and the, the dog's happy to see you, that's what they do, you know, in the wild. Canids do that. They greet and they lick the muzzle of the, of the, uh, of the parents. Um, to, you know, to regurgitate and get food. That's, that's just... Some of these behaviours are transferred. So they're replicating some of the wild... in the wild behaviours? Absolutely, yeah, mm. yeah. <clears throat> OK. Um, Robin, you're here with your schnoodle Bonnie. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this idea of emotions with Bonnie? <laughs> Look at Bonnie. She's fast Look asleep. <laughs> she's just... She's quite a picture there. Um, <laughs> what do you think about the idea of emotions with her? Oh, look, she's, she gets excited to go to work. We go out twice a week to volunteer and as we go to the car, she does 360s and sometimes little squeaks and things because she's excited to go to work. Um, now, she works as a therapy doll. What yes. does that mean? What does she do? We go to the Westmead Children's Hospital one day a week and we go to a mental health drop-in unit the, on another day of the week. And she just gives cuddles, she gives, um, she just lets anyone pat her um, at the hospital. When I get her to dance, and she does a bunny hop dance out of the ward, everybody loves it. It just breaks up the ward, it cracks up the nurses, and it just brings that little lift. And she does that just for a treat. So, and Would she just... do all of that without the treats, do you think? She will dance. Well, at home I do it um, without a treat. But in the hospital, I feel that she needs the reward because she is working and she knows she's working because she's got her ribbons and her bandana on. So. Brad, what do you think about the idea of love, dogs loving their owners? I think we, uh, we have to be cautious about how we, we uh, think about other non-human animals and the way they think and, and feel about things. And this idea of anthropomorphism, this... Uh, Placing human emotions. Dogs. Yeah, I think as scientists, we we definitely try and avoid um, and be as objective as we can. So, what do you think when you see Noodle in his shirt, in his dress shirt tonight? Then, <laughs> I think I think dogs are so successful because they're highly social and they basically fit in to whatever lifestyle, whatever human niche that they're in. Jade, are you dressing um, your dog Noodle mm -hmm. for you or for him? It could be for me, I have to say. <laughs> but, uh, well, in the winter, it's definitely for him because it's be cold outside. But this is a light white shirt, Jay. <laughs> I'm dressing him up today because he's on your show. <laughs> it's a special occasion. OK. Um, I also got to say, Jenny, that dogs are good human manipulators. They basically have nothing else better to do all day than observe our behaviours. So they know our nuances, they know how to basically manipulate us. It means, it means they're good survivalists. They, they, uh, they, this human niche uh, that they're in, they've, they've mastered it. So they could look at you and go, that person wants me to love them and I'll get what I want if I do that. So I might just try that. 
Yep. Yep. I you think, think so. they can be that ruthless in their in their thinking about what they're doing? I, I think they I think they're cleverer than you think about reading cues. Mm. So, and if you think they're manipulating people, yeah. do you find yourself slightly bemused by people actually thinking that you know they're feeling something else? Mm -hmm. Not really bemused, but I I think the the trouble is everybody's a, a dog expert. Anyone who's got a dog uh, <laughs> thinks they know all about dogs, and uh, very, people are very opinionated about. They're, they're about dog behaviour. Mm. Um, Glenn, your dog, the wonderfully named Fatas, um, is here. Now, let's have a look at what happened when you discovered a whole chicken had disappeared <laughs> from your kitchen bench at home. Come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> What is that? What is that? What is that? Did you eat that? <laughs> Did you eat that? Come here. Come here. <laughs> so? Did you eat that? You're a bad dog. You are a bad dog. No, don't you give me tail. <laughs> what is this? Bad dog. Go on. Go. My <laughs> <laughs> I assume you don't hit that dog violently to make it terrified. You know, no. It looked absolutely terrified <laughs> of what you were going to do. You know, I didn't see that as terror on her face. I saw that as guilt. <laughs> that, 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 to me, was guilt all over. Why do you think it's guilt? <laughs> um, well, I just, I mean, if we take a human emotion and put it on the dog, or, or a, a child where they get that sort of sheepish, like I've done wrong type of thing. That's what I associate with. That, that's my frame of reference for that emotion. Liz, so. you're a vet, you research dogs. Is Glenn's dog creeping into the kitchen for tasks? Is it guilt or is it something else? A lot of those behaviours would be consistent with a dog who is feeling fear. If you, I see them at the vet all the time, the, um, the lowered head, the averting of the gaze. It doesn't certainly mean anything awful's ever happened to that dog um, in that circumstance. But as we had... Um, bred, never, sis. <laughs> never, never. They've been bred and raised to be a highly socialised um, species, so they're acutely in tune to our... Um, our temperament, well, our behaviour as well. Certainly they could tell that in the owner's um, tone of voice and behaviour had changed and it wasn't for the better. And you yeah. know what? I will give you a story that refutes everything you've Go just said. Let's <laughs> I lived in Cape Town, South Africa, and in the middle of, you know, around maybe 11 o'clock at night or something, there was a noise downstairs. And so I, you know, made my way down and it sounded like glass breaking. And I thought, oh, here we go. And suddenly the stairs sort of did that and as I was coming down she was suddenly beside me and I said to her go go you go for you know you can attack you know you I'm not going you go you go and so I'm inching around and in the distance I see a colander that I had left and she knocked it over and it hit the floor now as far as I was concerned I wasn't mad at her yet she wouldn't go that to me says she knew what she had done was wrong did she not know that you were extremely anxious mm. about something and she yeah. was thinking, holy moly, there's something bad going on down there, he says so. You so. may be right, but I feel that that yeah. kind of was not in that situation where I called her in and I had that tone where, hey, the other one, I was like, hey, yeah, well, you're a great dog, you go first, you yeah. go. Yeah. I mean, really, they're motivated to survive, to 
require food safety, um, shelter and all those things that, um, that means they'll be a successful species. And that includes um, being surrounded by, by um, other beings that, that, and not getting into conflict with them. Steve, what did you want to say about this guilt oh, idea? It was quite interesting. Oh, I, I don't think it was guilt at all, but yeah. I agree with Liz ex exactly. It's, it's, the, it's the tenseness, the, up, the uptight and all the rest, of it, and the dog picks it up, and then we misread that by thinking it's happiness or guilt or, or this or that. Interesting. But it's actually what we do. OK, Kirsty, um, you're a specialist in animal behaviour. Do you think that dogs feel emotions? And what about negative emotions, like spite or...? You know, meanness or... Oh, I think dogs are more wonderful than that. I like to think that dogs don't, uh, don't feel spite. I don't think they're vindictive. I think they live for the moment. Um, that clip certainly showed to me a dog that was very apprehensive and concerned. And I think they do feel those negative emotions. We certainly see dogs that have anxiety disorders. It's very, very common. So, um, but whether they're the same as ours, I don't know. Do you treat Noodle like a human? Yes. <laughs> sort of. Um, I see him like my son because um, I, I would never have a human children myself uh, and yes I do. Day to day means there's lots of responsibility, there's lots of um, worries when he's sick and there's lots of joy when um, you come home to, uh, with, to him. Kirsty, do you think it's alright to treat dogs like humans? I think as long as we respect them and look after them and look after their physical and mental needs, I don't think it matters whether we call them as humans or dogs or, you know, fur babies or whatever. I mean, it's all about the individual relationships uh, and that's the important thing. So where do you draw the line with that? Is there a line? Well, I think there probably is, but I'm not sure that I've seen it as such. I saw people that, uh, you know, painted their dog's nails different colours. Now, I wouldn't do that for my dogs, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't harm the dog physically or mentally, there's probably no issue with that. Paul, would you pop a shirt on Kimmy? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, she did How not. do you feel about that? I mean, sitting next to somebody who, tr who says their dog's <laughs> like a human and he's got a dress shirt on. Everybody's got their own opinion, I suppose. <laughs> Dust doesn't float my boat. So you, <laughs> so you have a different view of what a dog is? Yeah, like, uh, they're all my work companions. Um, yeah, I treat all my dogs the same. Um, which I run, not, I've got nine work dogs. I can sit around at uh, Smoke A lunchtime and they sit around and, you know, get a crust of bread or whatever sort of thing and it's just, yeah. When you're out by yourself out in the paddock somewhere, they're the only people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Mesa, having listened to all of this, I mean, how do you view your guide dog? I just remember that moment going, I don't have to call Dad to pick me up. Like... I can, I can just hop on the bus and head home. And, and I, I, was, I did have that independence before, but not as much. So after I did the training, my life just shifted. Um, and then a year later, I went off to New York with her, me and her, and I just said bye-bye Melbourne. And, yeah, and I, that's how I feel about my dog. Um, I think she's empowered me, and she's given me a lot of empowerment. It's a great partnership. Hi, legs. Hi, legs. <laughs> Hi, legs. Hi, legs. <laughs> You balance, get up, hind legs. She'd like you to pat Why her bum. are you doing this to this dog? <laughs>Kelly, you're a dog breeder and trainer and you've brought your border collies, Flynn and Sketch, along. Um, they're pretty smart border collies. What can these two do? They can do quite a lot of things. So let's see if a couple of little things fall in. Can you sit pretty? You are very pretty. You want a pretty again? Good boy. Have you been bad? Have you been very bad? You've been very, very... He's very guilty. Very guilty. Can you drop for me? Flynn, drop. Good boy. You're bad down there as well. You are? Good boy. Can you cross your legs? You're very good. OK, up. Can you spin? Can you spin? Can you spin? Good boy. Flynn, drop. Drop. Can you scratch? You're going to lay on your back, are you? I wouldn't lay on your back. Stay. Hind leg. Flynn. You're going to hide your face again. Oh, he says he'd really like to roll over, I think. The GoPro is going to suffer badly there. Okay, come on. Up. Okay, where's Miss Sketch? Wait there. 
Okay. You ready? Miss Sketch. Oh. Miss Sketch, up. Great for the up. GoPro. Up. <laughs> ready? Up. Good girl. Go get up. Ready? Get up. Good girly. Well done. Flynn, can you drop? Flynn, drop. Just drop and stay. Sketchy. You ready? I need a volunteer. <laughs> that was very quick. Stand up first. Come on in. Okay. Can you stand nice and still there for me? Yes. Okay, sketch. You ready? Sketch. Hind legs. Hind legs. Hind legs. <laughs> quick. Hind legs. Hind legs. You balance. Get up. Hind legs. Hind legs. Stay. Hind legs. Stay. She'd like you to pat Why her bum. Why are you doing this to this dog? <laughs> I don't think I'm doing what, anything. What, what point does this have? That's what I want to know. I think, I think tricks don't have a point. <laughs> you know, tricks just enhance your bond with your dog, gives them something to think about. We get a lot of natural behaviours. Oh, she says, I like She's that going to I'm going to come and back onto you again. Thank it you It is a very that. unusual move. I'm just wondering how it, you discovered it. How I discovered it. I guess um, we like to get the dogs to think for themselves. So can I have a front paw too? So I guess it all started by teaching her that she actually has a back end. Um, a lot of dogs don't realise they have a back end and a front paw, thank you. So once we did that, we just sort of explored. But what do you think all of this is like for the dog? Um, as you can see, they like to learn things. I mean, they obviously get rewarded for it. They like what's it. in your hand. They <laughs> love it. They love it. Um, I don't think they would do it if they didn't enjoy doing it. Would you they do it teeth? if you didn't have those treats in your hand? Um, I think um, they wouldn't do it as enthusiastically, but for a dog to put its hind legs up on somebody, you can't force or make them do that. They've got to really want to do that. How smart do you think they are? I think they are very, very smart. Um, I think some are going to be smarter than others, but I definitely think they're all very, very smart. Mm. So do you define this, what they're doing here, as intelligence? What do you define it as? Um, I guess it is intelligence. Um, it's willingness, um, it's keenness to be with their person. Um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, take a seat again. Excellent. With these two, round of applause for the dogs. The dogs. Okay. Steve, are dogs that can do tricks smart or are they just trainable? And is there a difference between the two? I think some dogs are, are more easier to train than others. And I think what Kelly said, the willingness of a dog and the wanting of the dog to get a reward, I think can overshadow what a lot of people think is intelligence. Um, intelligence is uh, something that the dog understands and has a reason and can reason things out themselves. And then there's trainability. Okay. And intelligent dogs, I find, are very difficult to train. Why? Oh, because... Uh, example would be uh, a poodle, for example. You throw, you throw a, a ball into some cold water, big pond, and the poodle looks at it and says, listen, you threw it, you go and get it. <laughs> Where the Labrador goes, OK, I'm in there. So which one is the most intelligent is debatable, you know, but the Labrador is certainly much more trainable. OK, so is it easier to train a dumb dog? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 not so much a dumb dog, but a dog that's... Sorry that's, to all dogs. <laughs> a dog that's really very wasn't willing appropriate to learn. on this program to say that. Yeah. A dog that's very willing to learn. I mean, the Border Collie, um, we have one at home, and they are a magnificent dog. And all these dogs, you know, the, particularly the Border Collie, and you see it with the sheepdogs and, and Kelly's dogs, they've got, they've got a very strong willingness to want to do something for you and I think that's the key. So is that more a personality thing than I a think smartness so. yeah. thing? It's genetics, mm. it's environment. Mm. And um, I just wonder how you work out for yourself whether a dog's smart or not. I'll go to a pound and I'll get an 18 month old dog out of the pound, a labby or a labby cross or something. I'll hold and I'll bounce a ball around. If the dog's really interested in a ball or a game, I'll take the dog out, I'll throw the ball into some long grass, I'll hold the dog for five seconds let him go, he'll go and get it. Then I hold the ball, throw the ball again, hold him back for 10 seconds. If I can hold a dog for 30 seconds and he'll still go out and find that ball in long grass, he's in the truck and he's coming home with me. You've actually trained chickens to do things just to prove that it's not just about smart dogs doing things. So I've got a heap of chickens, hundreds of chickens, and uh, training the dogs not to hurt them or go near them and, and still find the rabbit odour, which we have to take down to Antarctica. The... 
I had a particular couple of chickens and I thought, I'll, I'll just try this as, a, as something to do. And, and I, tried, I trained a, do uh, a chicken to, to play the piano. And her name was Elizabeth and she played the piano really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, Elizabeth came to a very sudden and bad end. The, the dingo they had, called Blue, decided of all the hundreds of chickens to eat, he decided to take Elizabeth, which I was very annoyed with. But, um, yes, you can train a, a chicken to play the piano. You can train a chicken to play the piano. You must definitely. There's a side though, in, in, in Germany that ha recently happened where um, I believe it might be a border collie that has a, a large number of toys. And what they did was they took photocopies of those toys and they held it up for the dog and then the dog would have to run and go and bring back that toy. That's clever. That's so, very clever. Mm. I'd like to see that. I that's think not that's... something a chicken could do, I bet. <laughs> well, we'll never know with Elizabeth, Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> are some dogs breeds more intelligent than others? Some Smarter dogs are more others. trainable than... Breeds are more trainable than others. Siberian Huskies, Malamutes, uh, hound groups tend to be a little bit more independent and uh, Border Collies, herding dogs and gun dogs tend to want to work with us. Mm. Ryan, you've got three dogs. Uh, you've got Bella, a Tibetan yeah. Spaniel, Darby, a Chihuahua... Cross Pomeranian, who's here beside beside yes. you, and uh, a beagle called Harley yes. at home. The other two are at home. Do you rank them in terms of intelligence or? Uh, look, absolutely, I do. I think um, they they have to have some sort of level of intelligence to be able to perform anything in the first place. But I do think the reward plays a large part in in getting them to to do things. So I obviously with all of my dogs, they all respond to food, but. Harley um, particularly loves food, but you can also get her to do things like sit and drop without the food as well. But the enthusiasm may not be there and the willingness to keep going on and repeating that activity will wane unless there is a food reward mm. there for her. <coughs> Mesa, what do you think about how smart your dog is? And I just wonder how much of her judgment you rely on rather than the things that you've taught her. Crossing a street is probably a good example. Crossing a street, there is no ticker lights, there's no traffic lights. So we look at the movement of the people and sometimes when the tram is going past, I'm like, OK, there's, there's no oncoming traffic. And say, OK, forward. And then she refuses. And I'm like, why are you refusing to cross? It's because in guide dog training, they teach them car to becoming aware of it. OK, so do you think she's doing that to protect herself or do you think she's doing it to protect you or both? She has to protect her right shoulder. So I'm part of her right shoulder. And that's so just standard guide dog stuff. So how do you think she is? Is it trainability or is it, is it intelligence? Um, I think with guide dogs, they, I, personally, I think they are intelligent. Neslihan, go ahead. A um, um, very common thing that um, guide dog users would hear is, Oh, the dog is so intelligent. You know, they, they can, um, they know that they know when to cross the road. They know when uh, the light is red or green. Um, but I guess um, what people should remember is the handler is the pilot, whereas the dog is a navigator. So the handler does have to know um, where, like, where to go to. And the dog is basically getting um, the handler. Um, the safest way to get there. Mm. Brad, um, your research compares domestic dogs with dingoes. Mm. Which, which is more intelligent? Which is smarter? I don't think that's fair to compare intelligence. I think they're different types of intelligence. So, I, so wild canids like dingoes and wolves have to solve their own problems. No one else is there to help them. Whereas domestic dogs have humans and I think that dogs now rely really heavily on humans to solve all their problems for them. Sketch is starting to believe that I'm, I'm her trainer. Is that, um, is that, is that what's, what is going on here? I mean, this dog... Sketch is, likes to work and as far as she's concerned... You I'm part of the work sent, circle. Yeah, yep. you, well, we've got just that been right. beside each other and so, yeah, her, she air snaps when she wants something. She's air snapping at yes. me. Yes, yeah. yeah. she's basically <laughs> what saying... What does that mean? That's basically saying, yo, hurry up, do something with me. <laughs> what, like, hurry she's up, get through the show? Or she's just... manipulating you. She's manipulating me? Oh, yeah. OK, sketch. She's they really manipulate. intimidating me. She's <laughs> kind of... No, she really is. She's, she's looking um, at me with this They look are amazing on. at manipulating you to get exactly what they want. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um... <laughs> Debbie, uh, you breed beagles, and we'll talk about tuba down here in, in a moment. Um, 
You have six beagles at home. <laughs> is there a head of the pack at home? Definitely, yeah. Well, with beagles, they are definitely a pack animal. And um, in my experience, there, there's always a head of the pack. Um, and then it basically works its way down the pack. Tuba, bless his little heart, was the leader of the pack. Mm. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to Tuba. <laughs> I, I, I will promise we'll get back to Tuba. Um, Brad, has breeding made domestic dogs more or less smart than their predecessors? I, th I think it, we're not selecting for problem solving ability. We're, we're selecting for trainability and a ability to be able to live live um, in backyards and in households. I think that's that's where breeding is 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 going. Traditionally and in, in historically, we've been breeding dogs for working roles. So the you know herding or um, assisting humans. It's really about how dogs can help us. Okay, and we know that there's variation between breeds, but what about within a breed? Like, do you get, within one breed of dog, can you get a really smart one and a really not so smart yeah. one? I, I use the analogy that there's smart people and dumb people, and there's, you know, there's a, there's a highly trainable or a good, or a smart border collie and a, and a dumb border collie. Uh, Paul but, agrees with this, I think, yeah? And, the, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think most of it comes down to temperament and personality. You're looking at this, aren't you, Liz? The personality aspect of dogs. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And um, we've come a long way in defining personality, but I think we've got a way to go. And I think the example is the, the sheepdog that can be trained for a, um, a competition to do just as the owner says. And then there's the highly valuable trait of intelligence where they can be sent off to work stock and herd stock on their own and, and bring them back to a point. So um, it may turn out that the trainable dogs, one that is more sociable um, and um, more attuned to people. It may turn out that the um, problem solving dog is a calmer dog that gives its more, itself more time to think and reason. So um, the personality that is affecting their behaviour is, is definitely something we're working on. So is that research just to improve the lives of people? Um, no, I think it's important for both the welfare of dogs and for the um, outcomes for the farmers too in terms of saving them time and money because we know that um, uh, uh, on average about one in five dogs that uh, farmers acquire to do livestock, livestock herding um, turn out to be um, ineffective or, or dismissed as um, not having the right behaviour for the job. So if we can find out ways to make um, breeding the traits that farmers want more efficient and ways of um, managing and training the dogs to make their behaviour more desirable, then I think it's going to have positive welfare outcomes for the dogs and the farmers. Yep, Polly. If you pick a trait and you select on that basis, you end up getting more of that trait. And the problem we have with dogs is that we've focused on one thing or, you know, and particularly with some of the purebred dogs, we focus on one thing and take our eyes off other things and then other things start to go wrong. So we've got to be really careful, I think, in what we're breeding for and, and particularly the personality work. We've done quite a lot of work with personality of pet dogs and people don't necessarily need their dog to be intelligent. They want it But a lot of people say dog. they want smart dogs. But some people are wrong about that. Or well, they want a dog that... But their definition of smart is... You know, all these dogs here today that are sitting quietly in the middle of a crowded room with lights flashing on them, from an evolutionary perspective, that's really smart because these are the ones who are going to get looked after and go home and get fed and all that kind of stuff. So how you define smart mm. it depends... It's a very interesting question. ..very much on where you're coming from. Yeah. We bred Tuba in 2003. He was just special. How long ago did he die? He died in 2012. Debbie, tell us about Tuba. Tuba was, well, the love of my life, I guess, apart from my husband. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he was the love of his life too, apart from me. Um, we bred Tuba in 2003, um, and very early on we decided he was going to be one of the litter that we were going to keep. And um, we ran him on in the show ring and he did very well. He became an Australian champion, um, our one and only homebred Australian champion dog. Um, and he was just special. like. Anybody who owns dogs will tell you that they're all lovely, you love them all dearly, but there's always one special one. Um, and for us, it was Tuba. How long ago did he die? He died in 2012. Um, and how yeah. soon did you get the taxidermy done? Oh, pretty well straight away, yeah. Why? 
Well, we had decided a long time ago, years ago, that we were going to get him taxidermied when he died. We hoped it would be a lot longer. He was only eight, um, but it was a medical emergency and it happened. I mean, I'm not... I totally accept that it's something you really <laughs> want to do, but I'm just fascinated by why you want to have... I mean, the dog is no longer alive. The dog is no longer participating yep. in your in your life and communicating with you. And I'm, I'm just wondering what it is that, well, that you're connecting with. Yeah. I, I can understand that. And, and I'm a realist. I know he's not alive. I know he is stuffed. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> but, um, but he's still part of our life. He's still there. We, we still feel like he's part of our family. So you really connect oh, yeah. with, with him yeah. like that? Yeah. Yeah? All, the whole family? Yes. Well, when he first came home, it was quite funny. They, um, they sort of remembered him because, as I said, he was the, the boss dog. And they sort of remembered him and went, oh, he's back. Um, <laughs> but then they went to smell him. And, of course, which is what dogs do, um, he didn't smell. And soon after that, they just sort of forgot about him. Where do you keep him? Generally, he's in the lounge room with us. Um, but we've recently got his replacement, a new little beagle puppy boy. Um, and he started nibbling on his ears. Oh. So, <laughs> so we've had to move him to the office. And how much did you spend getting it done? Um, it's quite expensive. Um, look, and I un completely understand that not everybody could afford it. Um, Rodney and I decided very early on in our relationship that we were going to be child-free um, by choice. So basically we have a fur family. And... Um, it's an so do you treat them like children, do you think? Well, we don't humanise them, no. They, they are our family, but they are still dogs. And how do visitors react to Tuba? Everybody's different. Some people are <laughs> horrified. <laughs> some people think I'm crazy. Um, some people think it's great. Um, and that's all good. And, you know, everybody's got their own opinion. Mm. But I did it for myself yes. and Rodney did it for, for him and... We're really glad that we did it. Mm. OK. Um, Sally, you have an eight-year-old Cocker Spaniel called Lincoln. Where is he tonight? Um, he's with my ex-partner. Uh, we share custody of him since uh, we broke up about six years ago. So do you actually have a custody agreement about this dog? It's just something that we've worked out between ourselves. It's not a legal agreement. I think initially um, neither of us could bear to give him up to the other person, um, but we also felt that um, Lincoln would miss whoever he wasn't with. Um, I'm sure he would have adapted, um, but we're in a situation where we live quite close to each other, um, so he has uh, two happy homes and... If one of us is away, the other one can look after him. Um, and so it's working quite well for our situation. Kirsty, do you think dogs have feelings after a breakup? Yeah, I think they do. I do. I have a number of clients who uh, share custody with their dogs or cats for that very reason, that uh, I think sometimes it's for the people, but I think sometimes it's for the animal as well. Sally, um, given that uh, your dog can't talk, Lincoln can't talk, um, and the research is limited, how do you know what's in Lincoln's best interests in this situation? I guess we just make our judgments on his behaviour and how we interpret it, um, but he seems to uh, enjoy seeing both of us and uh, being in both of the households. Mm. Um, Jay, a Noodle goes to doggy daycare. Yeah. Um, what do you, what's your sense of how he feels about hmm. being dropped at doggy daycare? He loves doggy daycare. <laughs> Most of doggy daycare, they have doggy cam, so you can log on on a computer. And you, I, I could see that he's having so much fun running around with a bunch of other dogs. And, and um, when I pick him up, he would want to drag me back into the doggy daycare. So that shows how much he enjoyed that. <laughs> How do you assess whether your dogs are happy, Paul? Uh, just the attitude, I think. They're um, you're just taking them to work and... Um, what do you do they, if you think they're not happy? Well, there's got to be a reason why they're not happy. Whether it's I've put too much pressure on them, um, whether there's yeah, something wrong with them, you know. But how do you work out when you put too much pressure on them? I mean, how, how alert? Are you to the negative side of their behaviour? Or... Well, I just think it's years of experience. 
uh, being able to read the, a, a working dog, know when he's had enough or he's, or he's uh, feeling a bit of too much pressure. They might get a little bit more aggressive. Mm. Um, yeah, so you sort of, you know, it just comes with experience. Pauline, you've got 16 dogs, is this right? I do, yes. I, I, on and off, because I breed, so sometimes I have a litter of puppies and... Do you think they're all happy? I think so, yes. I think um, they do get all of my attention when I'm home and I think that they do really appreciate that. And I also think we are quite good at reading our dogs. We also have to think that we've co-evolved with these dogs, so we've been watching dogs and learning from dogs and we are really good at telling whether they're happy or sad or scared. Mm. Nicola, you're a lawyer, uh, your specialty is animal law. What legal rights do dogs have? Uh, I would say that currently they don't really have any legal rights. They are mere property at law. We have welfare laws to protect them, but that doesn't give them um, an inherent right. Do you think they should have rights, more rights? Yes, I definitely Why? do. Um, dogs and animals, for that matter, um, if they feel the same or they feel happiness, pain, why don't we treat them with the same respect that we would treat a human, at least giving it basic rights? So in order to give animals rights, we'll need to give them a status in law something like the legal personhood that we give to corporations or ships or um, other entities, churches, so that they can have some legal representation and be heard in a court of law. Um, we then need to be able to appoint guardians because obviously the animals can't speak for themselves. And this is not unheard of. They do appoint guardians to act for animals in other countries. Mm. Okay, Steve, what do you think? Uh, there's perspectives in life, and I think that um, I think our animals in Australia, in particular, are being very well looked after. But in perspective to um, what actually goes on in the world around, I think there's probably more things that are important at the moment. Uh, Brad, what do you think about the idea of giving dogs the rights that Nicola was talking about? I think when animals in general need more rights um, legally, but I. Putting them as a status as a as a person or equal to people, I think, is is a probably not not wise. But why? <laughs> why? Uh, uh, be, uh, yeah, I don't know. But difference. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what's being proposed. However, um, when we talk about rights for animals, I think it's about um, meeting their needs. So we've got a right to freedom of speech. Probably that's not what we're looking at when we're trying to attribute rights to animals. I think it's really important. And uh, at the moment, um, there is reference to these things in legislation, but that there are a series of codes um, and standards and guidelines that provide exceptions um, that allow us to um, raise animals and treat animals in some ways um, because of financial or practical um, benefits to us that may not be, um, may not be in the animal's best interest. Or okay, fair. Steve, what do you think? I mean, you said before that you thought that, you know, there were more important priorities, mm. but when it's put like that... Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I think, uh, I think if you're going to have an animal, they need to be looked after in a physical sense, and that means exercise, a place to sleep that's out of wind and rain, a comfortable position. They need mental stimulation, and, and they do need attention. And if you can't have the time, the money or the consequences to do that. You should not own a dog. Buy a goldfish, maybe, but, mm. but, but you shouldn't have a dog. And I agree how Tully... What, what was that? In the end, are we ever going to know what a dog feels or what's best for it? Does it matter? <laughs> does, does it matter? Does yeah. it matter? So uh, if we're getting something out of it, the dog's presumably happy and all of its physical needs are being met, does it actually matter whether it's really love or whether we're just interpreting it as love, as long as everyone's happy. OK, what do other people think? I, I think the dogs tell us stuff all the time and I think possibly what we don't do is listen to the dog. Um, and if we watch what the dog is saying and work with it, we'll have the answers we need. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you think we're ever going to really know? We know it's technology, you know, anything's possible. I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll be around when that happens, but uh, it would be nice to know. But I think... 
with the studies that are starting to come out, we're learning a tremendous amount that, that really they are further along that scale than perhaps porpoises and chimpanzees and everything else. And now that, you know, who knows what we'll find. No. Brad, what do you think? Do you think we'll ever know? Really? I don't think we ever will. And comparing species, I don't think it's fair to compare species on, on an intelligence kind of level um, because species are only as intelligent as their environment requires them to be. And so you can't, you can't give a, a test, to, the same test to a, to a chimpanzee and a dog. But isn't that the same argument that we're doing right now with humans and dogs and whether or not that they know love? We're Ab using a, a human scale to measure whether a yeah. dog has love. That's Absolutely. not fair. Yeah, it isn't. <laughs> we're actually getting more in But that's the only scale there is. Exactly, that's the only scale yeah, we well, have. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's how we view the, we view the world. Through human eyes. Through human eyes, and I, and I think that is going to always colour things. Mm -hmm. As scientists, we, we try not to do that. Um, <laughs> try. Uh, <laughs> OK, Liz, final comment from you. I just believe that I think we need to stand up to the challenge of trying to find out what is important to dogs and um, I think if we don't there's a real chance of unnecessary suffering if we don't know what's best for their welfare so we are getting more inventive about finding ways of asking the dog so I think we can do it. Thank you very much for joining us tonight everybody and thanks to all the dogs too just in case you understand and can hear me <laughs> and know what I'm trying to say. Um, they've been fabulous. They're all pooped actually. <laughs> Look at them. They're all completely exhausted. And that is all we have time for here tonight. But let's uh, keep talking about this on Twitter and Facebook. Next week on Insight, bubs in boardrooms. How would you handle having kids at work? We'll be back next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Well done.